Welcome to Positive Recovery MD. If you're listening, chances are you want to create happiness around you and thrive in your life. We're glad you're here and you've come to the right place. This podcast will inspire and motivate you to not merely survive your recovery journey, will give you the tools to build or strengthen your foundation to thrive and flourish in your life. Each week, we'll come together as a community to have authentic conversations around addiction, recovery, and what matters, growth and progress, not perfection, all while developing positive habits for you to utilize in your life. To learn more, please visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to receive the daily positive interventions that we'll review, as well as gain access to exclusive Positive Recovery content available only to Positive Recovery MD listeners. All right, let's get started. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to another installment of Positive Recovery MD with one of your hosts, Dr. Jason Powers, and I'm joined by Julie Denofa. We've got a really great guest today. I'm not going to read her entire bio, but I will say that she directed me to one of her websites. She's got an amazing history. She is a seasoned addictions coach and an addictions professional, a best-selling author. She's over 23 years experience working with drug, alcohol, and food addictions. Her deep understanding of drug and alcohol addiction, including the behaviors and ramifications that are associated with it, place her top in her field of addiction therapy and coaching. Her unique no-nonsense approach of cognitive behavioral therapy positive psychology, addiction coaching, and life coaching combined to provide the perfect support for an addicted person. Callie's background in food addictions and the emotional and physical tools it takes on one psyche and physical well-being is unique. Simply put, she gets results. And like I said, some of that was from the bio on one of her websites. Uh, You can go to one of them, either soberdemand.com, theaddictionsacademy.com, theaddictionscoach.com forward slash doctor slash Holly dash Estes or Estes, E-S-T-E-S. I will tell you three unique things about her and then we'll open it up and listen to her story. She is a PhD psychologist with a husband who is a touring drummer that was using heroin while she was helping others get off it. She started a company with 30 in her account. I don't know if it's $30 or 30 cents, but rent was due in five days, but she turned it around and is a success story embodied. She wrote three bestsellers, like I said, and created the largest online addiction school in the globe. Welcome, Callie. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Dr. Powers and Julie. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So you're in Miami, uh, where kind of like in Houston, when it rains, people don't know how to drive. I'm glad you're inside. But your husband, Tim, who's a drummer, and he's on the way. Uh, so he might join us in a little bit. But why don't you open up and kind of tell us like what motivated you to get into the field? And were you really a PhD psychologist dating or getting married to somebody using heroin? You were unaware of it or what's the story there? Okay. So I started in this industry 25 years ago and not by choice. I wanted to be an FBI agent. I did my internship at SCI Rockview, which is a medium security for men prison. And my uh, the warden said, you cannot work with the crazy guys because I wanted to work with like the Hannibal Lecters. He said, no, nope, no, nope. you're going to work with the drug addicts as an intern. And I'm like, oh, come on, they're boring. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, you have so much to learn. So my mentor happened to be ex-CIA and it was fa- fantastic because he taught me body language. And he said, if you understand body language, when you work with an addict, you will need, you will have everything you need to know in your back pocket because you're going to read what they don't tell you, because they're lying when their mouth is moving. So long story short, I started studying addiction, and I learned I actually had an addiction to food and an addiction to diet pills that were prescribed by a doctor. So I would overeat instead of purging. You know, back then in the DSM, you either eat, you know, binge and purge or don't eat. I would binge and then exercise, which wasn't, you know, an eating disorder, so I didn't fit the criteria. So they sent me to the fat doctor who put me on FenFen. Then I went from 140 pounds to 90 pounds like that. Well, I was doing this all day. And my mother kept saying, are you on the crack cocaine? Like my family's clueless to addiction. I'm like the crack cocaine, you know, and the Google, my mother. So I started studying it and I started looking for help and I couldn't find the help I needed. So I went into the industry to help people from the experience that I had. Fast forward. I met my husband and got married when I was 34. So I had some recovery under my belt and he would drink here and there, but he never did heroin. He was not in recovery. He wasn't, you know, a heroin addict. So we'd go out socially and have a beer, glass of wine. It wasn't an issue. And 
out of nowhere, a friend gave him a Roxy and an Oxy and he snorted it. And he's like, oh, this stuff doesn't work. And the guy's like, well, you need a couple. Next thing you know, he's snorting Oxy all day long. And I didn't realize it because they were $3 a pill and he was working and maintaining and going to bed at eight o'clock at night. And it was normal. And then out of nowhere, I was in Vegas on a trip with a client. I called him at like 10 o'clock in the morning and he sounded drunk. I'm like, we only drink on weekends occasionally. Like, that's not him. What's going on? And by the time I'd come home, I was like, what's going on? And he's like, oh, nothing, nothing. And that's when the pills went from $3 a pill to $35 a pill. So I switched to heroin and he got addicted. He was doing $120 a day of a habit. And then he got a hold of fentanyl and he overdosed. And then it became me trying to get him off of it and hiring people to help get him off of it. And, you know, three overdoses and a carjacking later, we finally got, you know, got him to want to get sober. But I had no idea. And when we met, he wasn't using. So he was, you know, for all intents and purposes, sober, except for a couple of drinks here and there. Okay. So I have a couple of questions. What's yes. normal about going to bed at eight o'clock? Like, even I don't do that. And people give me shit all the time because I go to bed early. Gets, what, what rock musician goes to bed at eight o'clock? He gets up at four to go to the gym. Uh-huh. So, uh, get up at four, go to the gym, go have coffee, and then go start his day and do his thing. Now, when he's on the road, obviously, you know, he's up all night. But with me, he'll go to bed at eight o'clock and then get up and go work out. So we've always had a healthy lifestyle. So I have, I have a, a kind of a side question. And there's tons of tangents that so you'll get used to me. But how much do you love that show Blacklist? Because that has FBI and CIA. I mean, it has all the things that you kind of wanted to start out doing. I don't think but, I watched it. I am so busy all the time that when I sit down, it's like I get off. 30 minutes of social media, 30 minutes of two and a half men, and I'm sound asleep. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you're a PhD psychologist doing sober coaching, it sounds like, or interventions or something. And like trying to get your husband off. How hard is it when you have your, your partner has addiction and you're in the field? I mean, I know there's a lot of shame that goes on in self-talk, like I should have known, but sort of like, how did you go about doing it? That would be. Well, yeah. I was smart enough to know I'm too close to the situation. So I knew I can't do this myself. I have to bring in help. So I brought in a couple of really close friends that are, you know, doctors and sober coaches, sober companions. And I said, let's do something alternative. Let's go to Colorado and try the medical marijuana. So we tried that. Well, that an experience was absolutely hilarious because he had, you know, that one of a kind reaction to edibles where like they start seeing LSD trips instead of like calming him down and getting him off. It made him trip. And I went, oh, my God, we can't use medical marijuana. So now let's let's try Suboxone. Let's try methadone. So we had to kind of go the more traditional route, but it was interesting because it was always like, I thought he had it and he was doing really good. He had six months under his belt and then his father got cancer and died literally in 30 days. We had no idea. His father was completely normal and then sick and then gone. And I'm like, oh, great, here we go. And he went right into relapse. And that's when he overdosed and the car got jacked. And it was just, it was constant chaos. And what got him sober in the end was I filed for divorce. I said, I'm done. I've done everything I can. I've hired everybody I could. I know that I'm going to walk away knowing I checked every single box. Here's the divorce papers. And he went, what? And I'm like, I'm done. I'm out. You know? And he goes, you didn't even yell at me because I'm, I'm Italian. You know, we yell. And uh, I said, no, I said, I'm done. I, I, I know I've done everything I could. And now it's up to you. And that's the day he quit. That's the day he got sober. Wow. Just like a textbook intervention in a way, right? Well, yeah, he was going to lose everything. And his friend his friend that's been sober for, I think he's like 15 years off of heroin said, what's wrong with you? You know, you're going to, you're going to lose everything for a drug that's going to kill you anyway. You know, make a decision, make a good decision. And that's what got him thinking. He's like, yeah, you're right. I'm going to be homeless and I'm going to be, you know, a complete junkie. And that's what preceded us to write the book. I married a junkie. Oh, so you wrote it with Tim. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's, it's him and I, so it's chapter eight. So it talks about my childhood and then him and then how he got addicted and then what we did, because we came from very two very different worlds. I came from the mental health family where my dad would put a gun to my head, just complete chaos, shit show. And he came from the perfect Beaver Cleaver family. Mom and dad were school teachers. His older brother worked for NASA. Baby brother's a psychologist. Everything was given to him. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of an interesting story. So did your dad... Was your dad in the mafia? You said you're Italian. I heard a gun. So usually I go Sopranos. Listen, I don't ask. I don't want to (laughs) know. I moved 2,000 miles away to get away from all those people. (laughs) 
wow, that is so growing up in a shit show kind of, you know, put you in, you know, the projection of your life is kind of predictable. You know, you didn't deserve that as a kid, but it also, I, I think to some degree, you didn't need the CIA guy to tell you how to read body language because as kids, when we grow up in a, like a chaotic household, reading people is a survival tool, right? So I bet a lot of that just came naturally to you anyway. Well, my dad's severely bipolar. So he's three weeks depressed, one week manic. So you didn't know what was coming in the door. Exactly. And then my grandmother's borderline. So that was a whole, and then the two of them would go at it. And then it was like this, this crazy, constant, just constant, constant bickering and fighting and arguing and yeah. Yelling all the time. All the time. I think that probably, like Dr. Powers was saying, I think that kind of sets us up to be prepared to know what's going on in a situation, to quickly analyze, read a room, understand what's going on and know how what you have to do to safely either stay in that room or figure out a way to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So interesting when you were talking about like, you know, here you are helping all these people, right, to learn how to live their lives differently whether that's from process addiction or from substance use disorder and your husband is suffering. Right. And so, you know, I have a similar experience too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, at the time I was a regional VP for one of the largest substance use disorder treatment facilities uh, in the U S and I was driving my car to the bail bondsman to get someone out after a DWI. I'm thinking, Oh my God, how am I doing this? And so there were lots of times where I was like, how am I able to help so many other people? But even with people around me helping my loved one, I somehow felt sometimes like, wait, something's wrong. How am I failing here? So, I, I mean, that's my story. I don't know if you've had any similar experience or even, even still, I think it also helped project me into helping other people more. So I don't know if you had that. Well, yeah, it was number one, it was educational because I was seeing it. Huh from the partner for the first time. So I've always worked with the partners and the families and, and the addicts, but I've never been in this situation. Now I'm in their shoes going, wow, now I see what they're doing. But I was smart enough to say, I need someone to walk me through this so I don't go down the rabbit hole of enabling. So I had a coach who would call me and say, how's it going? What's going on? And just keep me, you know, not going down that, you know, I just want to make sure you're safe and not dead kind of concept, you know, being able to back up. That was important. And I think had I not done that, I wouldn't have been able to run the company and grow the company because I was in his chaos all the time. And it was always chaos. I mean, you guys know, I'm stranded on the side of the road without gas, you know, and you're like, okay, right. So for our listeners, you know, who are out there that have loved ones that are struggling and are suffering um, from substance use disorder, what is, what is something that you recommend to the folks that you're coaching or the families that you're working with to best support them? So you have to figure out where they start and where you stop, meaning you want to help them, but you don't want their chaos to become your chaos. So if you start not going to the doctor and not going to the gym and not getting, you know, going to the dentist and not getting your hair done and doing the things you normally do, and you're so focused on them, you need a support team. You need somebody on your team that can say, hey, wait a minute, you're now enabling, you're not helping. You think you're helping, but you're not. And to give you an example, I had a, a mother who would take the client to the heroin dealer and hold the Narcan in the car, watch him get high and make sure he didn't overdose. And her theory was, at least he's not dying. And I said, you're driving him to the heroin dealer. And she goes, yes, but, you know, at least he's alive. And I'm like, we really got to talk about that because that's not helpful. And in her mind, it was. So getting her out of, you know, I'm saving my child because at least I can be here if something goes wrong realizing all you're doing is, you know, you're the inevitable is coming. Because what if he gets a, a lethal dose to car fentanyl? That Narcan shot's not going to save him. Nothing's going to save him. And it took probably three or four times of me explaining that to her and saying, you've got to get that help for you so we can help him. And sometimes the enablers worse than the client. By the time I got my hands on him, he's like, I'm so ready to be sober, but my mom takes me. So why would I say no? Oh my goodness, you know, and then we get him sober and then she's falling apart. I have no function in life. So it's kind of, it's difficult. If you're that enmeshed in the other person's life, you need a support team. And that's the most important thing you do. You can do is make sure you're okay first. It's kind of like riding in the airplane. They say, put the oxygen mask over you and then your loved one. The enabler person puts it over their loved one and then basically can't breathe. And they make sure the other one can breathe and then wonder why things aren't working. So 
that's my best advice. Can I switch gears a little and ask you how you use positive psychology in your coaching and your interventions and sort of your approach? Yeah. So I do something different. Instead of saying um, you have an addiction, that's a disease. It's not your fault. What I say is you have a problem. You have a vice. You have a coping mechanism. You have something that you're using to handle this issue. What other things can we do and how can we reframe the issue? So for example, your drug addiction is not your problem. It's a solution to your problem. What's your problem? If I can figure out what your problem is and we can reverse your problem, your drug addiction will automatically organically go down, if that makes sense. So we do a lot of reframing. We do a lot of exercises with positive motivation where we'll say these are, you know, my 10 worst traits and we make them your 10 best traits. Uh, We do a lot of toxic people release. You know, we have a circle of influence exercise. We put all the people in a circle and we figure out who's toxic and who's not and who you have to let go of to be the best version of yourself. Awesome. Uh, Okay. Uh, Interesting. Also, we've had so many guests that kind of the the topic of food addiction or or nutrition or health always seems to kind of be one of the hot topics. And and it's not intentional, but I, I tell tell our listeners what what your approach to food addiction is. And mind you, I'm not a huge fan of the DSM. Like your problem didn't exist because it wasn't in the book. But you know, not everybody's going to fall in a perfect category. Binge eating disorders. You know, um, it's just one of the hardest I think addictions to kind of deal with. Is so. What's your approach, and how do you get results? So sugar is the most addictive drug on the planet. That's where I start with people. So I ask them to go sugar-free for two weeks. And I ask them to go shopping in the grocery store and find food that has no sugar. So it kind of goes like this. Day one, they call me, they're excited. They shopped around the outside of the grocery store, not not up and down the aisles, because up and down the aisles is food-like product, not food. And they're all excited. I have vegetables, I have chicken, I have some rice. I'm ready to go. That's day one. Day two, they call me and they say, I have a headache. I'm irritable. My kids won't eat anything I've made. My husband ordered pizza. My life sucks. This is day two. We're going to get through it. Day three, they call me and they're like, you know what? I don't think I can do this. They're crying. I've had enough. I don't feel good. I'm achy. I'm nauseous. I have a headache. I have leg cramps, blah, blah, blah. I say, okay, you'll be able to do it. Day four, they call me and they go, Callie, I don't know what happened. I woke up in the closet with the Oreos all over the floor and all over me. I don't know how it happened. Like, uh uh-huh. But by the end of the week, they feel better. If I can get them to see they feel better, I can teach them how to break that sugar connection. So then I talk to them about white flour that turns to sugar and tons of fruit that turns to sugar. And we get them on a healthy eating plan. And I tell them it's not a diet. This is a lifestyle change. So even if you can make one small change, like no soda, and switch to water, unsweet tea, or even no sugar in your coffee. You can make one small change for 21 days. You can make a big change. And once they start to see that and they break that sugar connection and they feel better, their mind clears up, they lose weight, their skin clears up, they feel good. And when they feel good, they're like, I like this. And when they feel good, they want more. And then we get into exercise and all that fun stuff. So, so no sugar, does that include like no, no naturally occurring sugars, like no fruit whatsoever? They can have all the fruit they want, all the honey, uh, as much agave nectar as they want, just no white sugar and no white flour. So white rice is okay? They can do white rice limited because they, they, I don't want them off the chain on the white rice because that turns to sugar. Right, so right. limited portions of white rice. I prefer sweet potato over white potato. We get into all that stuff like midway. But in the beginning, I just want them to get the general concept down. You know, no cake, no candy, no yogurt that has 20,000 grams of sugar in it. That kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Like uh, sugar was my first drug. I, I really don't have a drug of choice. I, more is my drug of choice. I mean, I'm in recovery, thank God. But like I go through periods where I don't have sugar. And in those periods, I like I'll write a book or two and write a curriculum. And then when I'm when I'm on sugar, my it's like everything's wrong. And it's just terrible. But it is so hard to break. It is an all or nothing thing. And I don't think it's just me. Not that everybody, you know, everybody's not made like me, but even like a, even somebody like my wife who doesn't have a substance abuse issue, her brain seems to function normally. Um, It's just, it's like a huge inflammatory agent. It's linked with cancer now and all these things. And yet I know all this shit. And yet it's kind of like this voice goes, well, 
you're not doing drugs, you're not smoking, you're not drinking, you know, what's, well, you know, like then what? And, and it's crazy because I've experienced life without it. And, and so anybody listening, I, I'm with, my heart goes out to you, but I, I just wish there was an easy way to get to that end of the week. There's not <laughs> because that's like any other drug. And I always tell people, if you're the person that can't have one cupcake, you have to have all six. You might not be able to have any cupcakes. Exactly. And I tell them, you know, I tell my, my drug addicts the same thing. If you're the person that can't moderate your alcohol and have one glass of wine, you may have to be totally abstinent from alcohol. And I say the same thing with sugar. And they go, oh, my God, I can, I can never imagine a life without Ben and Jerry's. And then I get them two weeks without it. And they're like, wow, you know, I'm exercising and I'm working out and I'm so much more productive and I'm clear headed and I feel good. And I just got to keep them on the wagon. That's so awesome. Dude, what's, what's been your secret for success? Because anybody that starts a company with, I'm guessing it was 30 bucks, not 30 cents. 30 which bucks. went due in five days. That's insane. But I was super impressed with that. I was like, I got to hear this story. <laughs> this is the fifth company I've done that with. So I came from a very, very poor family that told me you will never go to college. We don't have the money. You will never make anything of yourself. You don't, we're not that family. You're going to marry the cute boy next door and buy a double wide and have two kids. And I went, excuse me, what? You know, that was it. I'm out. So everything I've ever done, I did with nothing. And I figured out how to do it. So in this particular company, I was working for a treatment center and barely making any money. We were always in the negative after we paid the rent. And uh, one day the owner came up to me and mind you, he pulls up in a Bugatti and he comes up and he, I said to him, you know, I, I'm, I'm really frustrated. I spent 60 weeks, 60 hours this week. I need a break. And he goes, you know, the only reason you can pay your rents because of me. And I looked at him and I went, what? And he threw a notebook at me. And I went, I got two words for you. And he goes, what? F me? And I'm like, no, I quit. And I walked out and I called my husband and I'm like, I quit my job. <gasps> we got rent due in five days. What are you going to do? I said, I got it. And he goes, how are you going to do it? I said, law of attraction. So everything I do is law of attraction. And I wrote how much money I want to make, plastered it all over the walls and took some business cards, $3 or $5, I think it was for shipping at Vista Print. And I handed them out everywhere and I got a call and I met with the guy and I closed the first deal and it was two grand. And there goes my rent and everything. And he goes, you just made two grand in like five minutes. I said, yeah. And he looked at me and he goes, does that law of attraction work for other stuff? I'm like, yeah, what do you want? He goes, I want to go on tour. And this is how he got to go on tour with the rock band. We did the exact same thing. And we focused on it, focused on it. He got a call in LA and he went out for the audition and he nailed it. And he learned the music in literally two weeks and went on tour with the guys. So that's sort of how I've always operated my company. If you operate from the right spot and you do nice things for people and you give things away, it comes back to you. Interesting. That is so awesome. And Dr. Powers is like drooling over there because I don't know if you can see in the background, but he's got drums back there. I know, I saw. Yeah, and so he's like, man, I could be a rock star. Like, you know, <laughs> I want to go on tour. So, but that's awesome. I love that story. And how long have you been in the Miami area? We moved here in 2010. So 10 years. almost a from, from where? So this is where it gets really interesting. My husband and I met in Manhattan. We moved from Manhattan to Tampa, Tampa to Satellite Beach, Satellite Beach to Miami, because that's where we had our uh, honeymoon. But I had just come back from L.A. So and I used to live in Dallas. I just I'm like a gypsy. I'm all around. And then when I met him, we, we kind of hung up shingles in Miami. Awesome. And so with, you know, South Florida kind of gets a lot of kind of notice around the substance use disorder treatment industry. And so but you seem to continue to flourish. in it. So. What do you love most about what you're doing now? Because you have so many different things that you're doing. And so if someone were to say, hey, what does Callie do exactly? Or what does she love? Or what brings her the most joy? What would that be? The coolest thing for me is when I get a call from a client two or three years after I've worked with them and they say, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm coming up on three years clean. Or, hey, I bought that house I was trying to buy. Or, hey, I got that promotion. Or, hey, I wrote a book. Or something cool. That's the neatest thing for me. And the same thing with a student in our school. If they come back and say, hey, I'm building this company or I did this or I'm helping these people I'm feeding the homeless, what, whatever they can do positive makes me feel good because we had a hand in getting them to that point. And then if I can help them get to that point, they can help a lot of other people get to the same point. So it's kind of like a, a chain reaction. And that's the coolest thing when we get those calls. 
So that, that must be where your favorite piece of advice, when you said that if you're lucky enough to be successful, send the elevator back down. Yep. So that's, that's you. That's what you want to do is to continue to give that way. Exactly. Because I, I was the poor kid. I mean, we, we did nothing. We had no money. I had two pairs of shoes in high school. I had three outfits that I would rotate throughout the week. And I was lucky enough or, you know, worked my butt off, whatever you want to say to get where I am. I want to bring those people with me. I don't want to see them suffer. I want them to be as successful as me. If they're as successful as me, they can bring more people up and we can continue that chain of helping and being successful. Awesome. Tell me about your school. So the Addictions Academy is the largest online school for addiction studies. We have uh, classes like Certified Recovery Coach Level 1 and 2, Intervention, Advanced Intervention, Clinical. We have Sober Companion Training. We have Sex Addiction Training, Nutrition and Recovery, Food Addiction, Internet Addiction, Social Media, Heart Reduction, which is the Clean Needles and the MAT programs. And then we have a whole Cancer Training program. And then for Treatment Centers, I'll go in and clean them up. So we do like an admissions call center training with some ethics. We do an AMA blocking to help people stay in treatment and not leave. Um, there's an ethics class. We do a UR management utilization review and a billing class. And then I have a mastermind that teaches people how to utilize all this training to get clients and build their practice. Wow. You've got it all covered there. I'm trying. I'm trying. And then that was born out of necessity because I was getting too many calls and I didn't know who to call. I started kind of giving referrals and realizing these people I was referring to couldn't give the quality that I wanted and the ethical quality, especially being in Florida, you didn't exactly get the ethical quality. So I said, let's create a school where we can train people. That way, if I give you a client, I know you know what to do because you've taken my ethics class and you passed it and you've gotten trained and you know what you can and can't do and what you should and shouldn't do. Wow. That's awesome. Amazing. Thanks. Really cool. So at Positive Recovery Centers, we use the Positive Recovery Daily Guide, and we also uh, do what we call positive interventions. And I think probably some of your experience and some of how you've manifested things along the way probably comes from times and periods, too, where you've quieted your mind in such a way to slow down enough to kind of get to where you have to go and figure it all out. And so today's um, positive intervention And all of our positive interventions start with a quote. And today's quote is by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it is, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. So looking within yourself is a powerful way to develop emotional sobriety. Indeed, knowing yourself is the first step to growth. Meditation, the practice of calming the mind and developing awareness of the workings of your consciousness, is a foundational technique to enhance meaningful self-knowledge. You will be meditating several times throughout the year in positive interventions because it is so vital. In fact, consider establishing meditation as a daily practice. Understanding patterns of thought, develop emotional sobriety and equanimity. Additionally, meditation aids brain repair and development and reverses the effects of stress on the body and mind. So our positive intervention for today was that we ask that folks sit in silence for five minutes twice today or otherwise find a comfortable and quiet place on the floor or in a chair and simply focus on your in-breath and your out-breath for five minutes. Bring your consciousness to the rhythm of your breathing, paying attention to your thoughts and observing them as if they were as observing them from a non-judgmental third person perspective. So after each meditation uh, session, we're asking that folks journal about where your mind took you, creating a special where my mind wanders section within your journal, and keep all meditation reflection notes in that section for easy reference and to track your growth. And so for me, I actually um, started meditating on a regular basis, probably, gosh, it's been a while now. I think it's going close on eight years. And I make sure I do it daily because it really helps me start my day in a way that um, is focused. And then I can also look at what I'm going to intentionally focus on for that day. And so this is not a hard positive intervention for me because I love the excuse of having to slow myself down. (laughs) Like, oh, wait, I have to meditate. (laughs) Um, But it's really changed and shifted my life um, pretty dramatically. 
I didn't start journaling about it until about two years ago. And I have, with today's positive intervention, I did reflect back on some of what I journaled in that section of, of the journal. And I have to say, I wasn't really all that great of putting notes in there to actually look back on, but I did some. So at somewhere along the line, I was trying to do the right thing. And what I notice is that when I take a look at where I'm going, it's always related to, uh, to something that I'm trying to accomplish. So I, I don't know that that's really anything more than I'm always trying to do the next best thing for myself and for others. So I think that is something maybe Dr. Estes and I share a little bit about. So thanks so much for sharing all that you did uh, in regards to how you give back. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys doing what you're doing and the work you're doing and having people on and positive goes a long way. It really does. And then this world of recovery where there's so much negative and so much downtrodden, it's nice to be part of something that's not. For sure. Dr. Powers, did you do anything with the, your meditation? Because I know you spent a lot of time in it. I did. I did. Well, I go through phases where I do more. But um, so, Dr. Estes, we're, um, we're going to give you a copy of this book, even though, you know, we didn't get the PI to you in time. But it's something that you can kind of thumb through and you'll probably recognize a lot of the interventions with your experience in positive psychology. But yeah, so, so I did this, um, a couple times, a couple days this week and journaled and I kind of forgot that I was supposed to be sitting or laying down. I, I did it in the pool. So I have these like floats and <laughs> <laughs> I have like, I have like eight people living in my house right now. So it's just like really hard to find quiet. And, uh, the only, the only way I could, we don't what? want to hear your excuse of why you had to journal in the pool. Just no, no journal, meditate. You're meditating in the pool. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> I do it on the treadmill at the gym. Like people are like, how do you meditate? I'm like at the gym. And they're like, what? I, I have to be in motion. I have to be with all the sounds around me. I cannot sit still and quiet. I can't do it. So I just find that funny because that's kind of like my mentality. The opposite. Yeah. 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 Well, the only way that I could get quiet while I do these podcasts is to duct tape my kids to the wall with their <laughs> mouth closed. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to put them through that, uh, you know, traumatic event just so I could meditate. But you know, it's funny. My mind doesn't go to like what I'm doing next. It's like, I got this critic in me that is super loud and five minutes is barely enough to get through that. But when I do, then it generally, then I can kind of knock on the universe and listen, mm -hmm. but I, I have to get this like annoying critic first. So five minutes is, t is really like the worst part of it. Anyway, that's just my experience. So I was like, I hate the five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's really sometimes just like a minute or 30 seconds, but man, you guys are lucky. I got this crazy guy living in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just moved out of mine and into yours someday. So I don't know what to say, but so Dr. Estes, when you're doing yours and you're just moving through it at the gym, what is that experience like for you? It's powerful. I get all my ideas at the gym or in the shower. So mm -hmm. it's like when I start to hear that inner critic, I'm like, you know what? I don't have time for that. And I tell it, basically to shut up and go away. I don't want to deal with it. And then once I set it away, it's like, okay, now we're on, we're focused. We're going to come up with ideas. And if I'm in motion, I can get the ideas. But if I sit and try, I mean, I've tried the whole meditation where you sit and you own after like three minutes, I'm staring at the ceiling, I'm staring at the floor and I'm like, okay, I can't do this. I just can't, my brain won't do that. So I use like non-traditional ways to meditate. There's a meditation out there. And I don't know if you guys saw, it's like a minute and 30 seconds. But it's like an F that meditation. Oh, I saw that. That's awesome. <laughs> I listen to that when I'm like ready to like jump out of my skin. I'll put it on and it's just like, ha, ah, it's instant because it's so, it's so different. And that's sort of my mentality. I have that very, you know, New York, Philadelphia mentality that I just can't, I can't bring it down a notch unless it's aggressive. And there is metal yoga that I used to go to where they do metal music and like Ashtanga yoga. And I would walk in and instantly I'm like on 11, I'm all ramped up and instantly I'm like, bam, nice and relaxed. And all these ideas are flowing. And everyone's like, how, how you've got Metallica blaring and Megadeth and you're like in another world. I'm like, I don't know. That's my thing. It's just how my brain works. It's weird. So I try to get my clients to do it. And a lot of my clients are similar to me where they're like, ah, you know, too many type A's. I can't do that. And I'm like, well, try this. Oh, wow. That was amazing. And then they'll come up with the whole concept of being able to relax. Nice. Well, I got to look into that. I got to see what that's all about. <laughs> oh yeah. It's fun. And there's an angry yoga too, where you come in and like, you're allowed to yell. It's so cool. So if you're having a really bad day, you can go into bloody yell and scream and cuss. And after like 10 minutes of it, you're like, you know what? I'm done yelling, screaming and cussing. And it's like, you could, you just, 
con- you just feel like, ah, uh, you know, and it's really good. <laughs> That's funny. I, I would love to be a fly on the wall when like, you know, like a bunch of yogis from India were in that yelling yoga. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for being on our show. Well, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Gally and Julie. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast and we will talk to you later. Signing off. Thank you for listening to this episode of Positive Recovery MD. Don't forget to visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to get your daily positive intervention sent straight to your inbox. Be sure to subscribe to Positive Recovery MD on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts to receive an automatic download when a new episode drops. And as always, if you or someone you know needs help, visit PositiveRecovery.com or call 877-4-SOBRIETY which is 877-476-2743. We are here to help.